So, um, welcome to the first, first session of contributed papers at this conference, uh, which is on quantum cognition, the first of two sections on quantum con cognition. Uh, so, I, to begin with, I'd like to present uh, Irina Vasieva, and this is joint work with Andre Krenikov, who's been a <coughs> regular contributor at some of the previous editions of this conference. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for coming, and uh, we'll hear about testing the boundaries of applicability of quantum probabilistic formalisms. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good morning. It is my pleasure to be here and to speak before you. As um, um, the main point of my talk is to advertise uh, triple free sleep <coughs> experiment instead of two sleep experiment. So um, you see, quantum formalism has been successfully used to different uh, tasks in cognition and decision making, and um, to list some of them, I can say that. Uh, also behavioral economics and uh, finances, psychology has been treated by quantum probability theory with some success. And uh, Andre, as you see, uh, published uh, some books on this. And um, there are some representative articles which cover um, different topics from cognition and uh, describing different paradoxes which cannot be uh, successfully treated by a classical probability theory. And um, one of the most exciting things that uh, for me was uh, quantum application it was to treat common knowledge by quantum formalism. And uh, also together with uh, Andre Krenikov, they applied uh, quantum probability theory to modeling decision making in biology. They said, well, cells can decide whether to eat lactose or to eat glucose by using quantum evolution. And uh, let me stress that in all these uh, works, uh, of course, we use uh, statistical data and we say there is uncertainty, there are some processes and there is a, a quantum probability theory. So uh, let's just apply probability theory to statistical data. We do not claim that there is uh, a concerns actual physical processes in the brain like Roger Penrose or Stuart Hammer claim. We say ju it's just uh, the matter of statistics. So in principle, somebody can say that we uh, use quantum formalism as uh, hidden parameters uh, for men because there are contexts, there are some things which are unknown, and we say, okay, let's apply quantum probability theory instead of classical one, and we will be able to describe some paradoxes and resolve some <coughs> problems. And um, there are a vast majority of problems and paradoxes which can be solved in this way, but uh, the idea, the, the main question is uh, how far can quantum probability theory go? What are the boundaries uh, of uh, the applications in cognition, psychology or economics? And uh, interestingly, also these questions have been posed before and some attempts to analyze have been made. For example, as I, in the talk presented by me some years ago in this quantum information conference, so we addressed the question of combining order effect and repeatability. And uh, this problem should be not so easy, not to we couldn't get a definite answer to this, so probably quantum probability theory would be able to combine this and probably we would not. And of course, to, to treat this problem, we needed positive operator valid measures, 
but uh, in the talk I present today will be just uh, normal projectors as observables. So one of the most famous boundaries of quantum probability theory is the so-called series of bound for correlations. We know that for in quantum mechanics it's two square root of two, and for classical correlations it would be just two. But if we consider just uh, random variables uh, as general as it may be, it, this value can be as high as four. And interestingly, in real quantum experiments. Uh, quantum physicists do address this uh, question, but uh, the problem is they have uh, so many uh, loopholes and other problems, so of course they never reach this bound, uh, let alone to exceed it. But uh, one of the interesting things for, for me was when I was in Vienna and I was discussing with the guys one of the Bell's inequality experiments they posed, they observed some 2.5 maybe, which is within quantum bound. But then the other guys published a paper where they treated the same experiment, but in a more rigorous way, applying quantum field theory and taking into account a laser beam, not as an abstract Hamiltonian, but rather as a normal operator of so creation and annihilation, and then they proved that in the experiment, this value cannot be as high, higher than 2.1. So it was already a sort of uh, violation of the quantum bound. But of course, nobody was bound with things like that, because it's not uh, easy even for, for them to realize which uh, Hamiltonians are more related to the problem we actually experiment on. And um, in quantum physics, this bound can be used as a, to falsify the theory, to falsify our understanding that uh, quantum mechanics governs a real physical world. But of course, as we apply quantum formalism to cognition, we say it's just uh, a formalism, it's just a method to describe something. So, lucky or not, we do not um, expect this to falsify anything. But of course, uh, we expect that uh, there will be cases where quantum formalism would not work. And what would they be? even for uh, violating cl classical probability theory and uh, saying, okay, we observe quantum correlations which are so strong, we can then provide some explanation for this. For example, we say uh, there is a signaling, but interestingly, the signaling is uh, not so hard as to violate quantum bound. So, um, um, our idea is to uh, generalize uh, the law of total probability. Of course, it's not me or it's not Andre who did that, but uh, the point is that uh, in many experiments in cognition, for example, on disjunction effect, we observe violation of the law of total probability. And we say, okay, it is uh, violated repeatedly in quantum probability theory, but not in classical, so let's uh, use quantum formalism here. But it's not the whole story because there's a guy Sorkin who did use the same equality <coughs> as law of total probability, but for free valued observables, or as an analog, analog, you can think of a free sleep experiment instead of two sleep. <coughs> And um, the point is that for quantum probability theory, uh, this equality should hold. Like we have um, two slit experiment, we have the law of total probability. It uh, shall hold in classical probability theory, 
but it doesn't hold in quantum. And then we go to a free slit experiment, we have an equality which must hold both in classical and quantum. So if we observe a violation of this equality, this would mean that our data is not even quantum. Of course, in a sense that it's not quantum formalism, which can be applied, uh, I can say explained, but cannot govern this. Uh, so, uh, of course, in real world physics, this would mean that uh, quantum probability theory is falsified as describing the actual reality. And uh, really, Gregor Weiss in Austria is now doing this experiment, but he hasn't observed any violations so far. So, I would like to mention also some guys in cognition who also know about the free slit experiments and try to make it an experiment check of them, but also, finally, none have succeeded so far for various reasons. Uh, Emmanuel Potos or the guys from Nice, they say that they are interested in it and they take some steps, but nobody uh, is there. But my opinion is that it's uh, really a very simple experiment, as opposed to this experiment in quantum physics. In cognitive science, it would be uh, no uh, such big difference, it just uh, contain a large enough sample, and uh, then you can get on all the necessary data. So, how it goes in classical probability theory, let me present for the first time, we can use conjunction and disjunction and to say, okay, probability is additive. If we have two not intersecting events, then we can add probability. And uh, this is all very well, but we cannot proceed uh, verify in quantum formalism because there is no such thing as uh, we can take a union of quantum events. So in order to deal with this, we would like to use conditional probabilities. And we can say, okay, we can write down additivity laws using either unions or conditional probabilities and say we have a formula of total probability. And if we subtract one part of the formula of total probability from the other, we can get what we call interference term. And we say that in classical probability theory it is zero. And uh, this is what we violate in cognitive experiments. While, of course, in classical physics it is not violated, but it is repeatedly violated in quantum probability theory. And we suggest that we can take three events instead of just two and consider the union of them and consider what would the formula of total probability look like. And uh, again, we can write it down using conditional probabilities and say uh, that there is a similar expression for free valued observables. And uh, the interesting thing <coughs> is that we use probabilities and we can <coughs> deal with probability of uh, one event or of the probability for a photon to go through one of the three slits. And then we can close, for example, one slit and ask ourselves what's the probability that the photon would get here using these two slits or these two states and use all the combinations. And uh, then we put all these probabilities into one formula and say, okay, this is the expression which must be zero. 
all this uh, concerns just classical probability theory, and we say, okay, it must be zero classical probability. Uh, this long expression using various uh, probabilities of going through one, two, or three slits. And uh, naturally it is zero, because if uh, the previous one, previous um, interference term which was concerned uh, two values was already uh, already holds already was zero and then uh, it's just a simple consequence that all the subsequent uh, interference terms would be also zero it is uh, an easy theorem if you would and uh, of course in classical probability theory, this uh, three parts interference term is zero. But uh, the idea is to show that it is zero in quantum probability theory as well. And what Sorkin did, he used uh, this mm -hmm. union of uh, events to show this. And uh, we show the same thing just using <coughs> conditional probabilities. For example, we have um, various observables, A and B. A is, uh, can have three values, and B is the autonomous observable. And uh, we restrict uh, ourselves in this consideration of the uh, projectors. And we can say, OK, what answers or what values can we get? And uh, we can define conditional probability and define also ordered conditional probability. Because uh, you see A constraints on B and multiplied by well, the corresponding <coughs> probability would not be um, the same as we uh, measure this uh, observables the other way around. So, of course, it's the most interesting case for us, the case when there are, these values are different. So, um, we can calculate these conditional probabilities and put them into a formula for interference and say, okay, we got to a formula of total probability in quantum physics in the last line here. And we say in quantum probability theory it's not zero very well, and it is uh, noted in many uh, papers on application of quantum formalism and cognition. But we go further, we say, okay, what would be the value for free apartheid interference term? We write down these conditional probabilities using traces of projectors multiplied by our density matrices. And uh, the idea of certain was to add at the end also interference terms re regarding two part interference. This allowed us to get rid of all phases in this expression. So in final expression, last line here, we have only probabilities. We do not have any phases. We just can collect data, get probabilities, and put all these values into our formula and say if it's quantum or not. This is, uh, I don't know, just a guess or some lucky situation we are in that we have such a simple formula. And we say that this uh, interference term must be zero, both in classical and in quantum mechanics. So if we observe violation of it in our experiment uh, or in cognition or economics or what have you, this means that we cannot apply quantum formalism to here, but probably it means that we are in some more rich situation. And uh, the other way around would mean, would mean that uh, there is more to quantum explanation. It is a non-trivial 
effect a non trivial <coughs> situation where we are, that our statistics would obey quantum formalism, not classical, but stays there. It doesn't just go as far as it is. So I, I think this would be a really interesting experimental check. And a suggestion for experiment, this is very raw, and I apologize for, for it, because uh, personally I didn't ever perform any psychological experiment, and I don't know how they the go. For example, we pose some questions which are, cannot be measured simultaneously. I mean, Operators do not compute, and uh, it is, the answer depends on the order that they ask. So we do get non-trivial interference terms even for two-part interference. So we can ask people, for example, would you like to immigrate some countries, A, B, C, and uh, then pose them another question: Are you ready to change your profession? And we think that. If we say that ABC is a choice out of three, what the combination of answers would be, uh, for example, yes to the first uh, question and no to the second question. And um, when we present the choice only of two countries and also collect all the relevant statistics, of course, we need another group of participants for that and we have to use some, I don't know, assumptions about it being very typical, but obviously it's a normal deal, as I understand, to, to do these things. So we can say, okay, if you have a choice of emigrating only to one country, what would be the probability that you will change profession? and collect all the relevant conditional probabilities and just put them into the formula and see if it's violated or not. And uh, what is interesting here uh, is that suppose we um, do observe violation. Uh, I think it's uh, the most probable case because for, uh, I see no reason for this combination to be equal to zero, but uh, it means that we can go further. We can say, okay, this three-part interference terms term is not zero, but the next four-part interference term can be zero. So we can go then uh, put still hard experiment, collect more statistics, and put it into a four-part interference term, and say. Uh, we want to classify uh, cognitive experiments. For example, say this class uh, is class free. It, uh, it stops uh, at uh, interference uh, free part term is zero. And this class of experiments is type four. So then three parts is violated, but four parts, uh, like four sleep experiment uh, is not. So. And this is interesting and probably it can tell us more about kinds of experiments we're dealing with. And uh, that's what I would suggest, actually. And that's about it. Thank you. So this... Uh N values are the actual numbers of people who answered in a particular way? out of large group of yeah, people? Yes, yes, no number from this subgroup, yes. Yeah, then I, I, you know, if it is, so you are simply counting, let's say you have 1,000 people, 500 of them answered Canada, 250, Brazil, 250, Australia, and then out of these 500, one half answered yes, and the other half answered no. Do I understand correctly this? Yes, yes. But then, you know, classical, formula cannot be violated in principle, right? It is just simple arithmetic then. 
you know, the probability, the, the total number of people who would say yes. Uh, no, no, I, I mean, I collect uh, probabilities for the answer to question B. I, first, of, first of all, I get subsample of people who answer yes, I would like to go to Australia. And then I, for example, count the proportion of them to say yes, I'm ready to change profession. And then I take this aside and I say completely different sample and say, would you like to go to Canada? And of the sample who answers yes, I say, are you ready to change profession? So the question, are you ready to change profession can be everybody answers no, yes and you can have as large number as you want. I see. Thank you. So it, it means that they are getting to answer B separately, yes, yes. and then you also compute B yes, 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 uh, from yes, that yes, yes. thing. The and formula this, is yeah. for, for answers to be for sub, for, for answer yes to question B. That's what I mean. But uh, I, I, I feel that uh, you can design more of the, the experiment. I cannot think of the better one Another question? I have a question. Um, well, I'm not an expert in probability, but um, I think classical probability does not admit uh, interference or something like that. Isn't this not the, the assumption of the independent event? Because yes, in, yes, in classical yes. probability, you have some formula which you call inclusion exclusion uh, yes, oh, formula, I mean where you can have this minus plus. And Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, disjoint the event if you do the probability of the conjunction, uh, the disjunction, you you have P, P A plus P B minus P A B, so you, you get this kind of term. So I don't know what is the um, yeah, meaning. It's it's yeah, it's zero. zero. The, the I mean, meaning that the, the 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 conjunction is zero. Probability of the conjunction. Yeah, okay. so that's why. Okay. It's just simple stuff. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I would like to stress that uh, if uh, s something is zero, for example, it uh, automatically means that all the other interference, higher order interference terms will be zero okay. as well. The, the, the Both in classical okay. and in quantum probability theory, so there is nothing <coughs> of interest there. But uh, I mean, okay. there in the field where we can fully rightfully expect yeah. that it will not be zero for three, for four, and uh, are the interferences only just pairwise, or are you suggesting you have ternary interferences as well? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, yes, we suggest to use formula for ternary. Uh, formula for ternary must include this uh, double interference term yeah. as well, as a part in order to get rid of the phases. In order for us to be able this uh, work just with probabilities like this equation for Q, such as. Yeah, because I, I remember, I, I might be able to chase out the rest of them, but I think there was a paper that came out in Nature that sort of ruled out the possibility of any ternary interferences in these things. That they, they always have to be binary. Should be binary. On, on no rocket science, it's, uh, of, of course, it's. Uh, and we do not claim that it's our achievement to write down this formula. And we suggest to use this Sorkin equality because it is from quantum probability and here wrote this down, but using somewhat different, I don't know, approach, not using conditional probability. Actually, on time. So, <laughs> double thank you. <laughs> no. which, which means you're under no time pressure when you say another at all. But you, you can all talk amongst yourselves and get, get another cup of coffee if you like.